All right. Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence, uh, another in the Actionable Intelligence interview series. Today we have a very interesting guest, I think prescient for, from a lot of the emails and DMs I'm getting from people that are threatening to leave the U.S. But uh, everybody knows I'm uh, very interested in inter internationalizing myself, moving things around, making the world my oyster. One of the things I haven't done is get involved in international real estate. And today's guest, uh, Ladislas Maurice, is uh, this is his expertise. He is a international man, if we want to say. He uh, lives in many countries, travels, and does international real estate. So uh, welcome to the uh, podcast, uh, Ladislas. Hey, John. A real pleasure being here. All right. So what I thought we'd do at first is just kind of like let you introduce yourself a little bit and why, should, you know, what your background is, is as you feel comfortable and, you know, what, what brought you to this uh, point in your life here as a international real estate investor. Sure. So a bit of background. So I did my bachelor's degree in Canada, then went off to Australia for graduate school to study. I studied business and law when I was there. And I got my, my first corporate job was with Nestle. So I joined Nestle headquarters in Switzerland. And pretty quickly, they sent me to Africa as an expatriate. So I spent four years in Johannesburg in South Africa in marketing and in sales. And then I was sent to Ghana. And there I was on the executive board of Nestle Ghana in charge of the milk business for a few West African countries. So Ghana, Ivory Coast, uh, Sierra Leone and Liberia. So in those seven years in Africa, I traveled across the whole continent. And at the age of 30, I wanted to try something different. I had, I felt I had done the whole corporate thing. And I knew that if I want to become an entrepreneur, I need to jump when I'm in my thirties and I have the, I have the, the energy and, and the, and the stamina to do so. So the first thing I did was to go on a road trip just to clear my head. So I went with uh, my parents, actually. We did a road trip from Oman, so near Dubai, um, to uh, Paris by car. Wow. So we drove through all of Iran, <laughs> um, Armenia, Karabakh, where, where there was the war recently, Georgia, all of Turkey, then Greece, and then up to Ukraine, and then Paris. So fantastic trip. And along the way, I saw all these, it really opened my eyes to all these opportunities. You know, these like little countries you never hear about, you know, like Georgia or even Turkey. Turkey, for example, is most people think Turkey is third world, but you drive across Turkey and you come across cities of 1 million plus people that are just brand new. Everything's new in these cities, new buildings, uh, new highways, massive mosques huge campuses, big hospitals, everything's new. So, you, and it's, I wasn't expecting to see this. Um, and then you entered Europe and everything felt like I was a bit in decay. Uh, so just going from Hungary, which is objectively poorer than Austria, just in Hungary had better highways than Austria. Um, so I started doing real, I got involved in real estate deals in a few countries and in, uh, in the Balkans and in Central Europe and in other countries as well. And I don't just do real estate. I also play in the, play in the markets as well. And um, my friends after a while started asking me, Ladislas, uh, you seem to be traveling all the time, but you don't have a job. <laughs> 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 what do you do? What is it you do? So I started a blog, um, just blogging about my experiences and then the investments that I saw uh, that I saw along the way. And gradually this blog turned into uh, into a part time, a part time business. So now I'm a full time investor and a part time blog manager. Interesting. And uh, our paths cross because we have uh, mutual uh, acquaintances and of friends, and I've been following your work. And one of the things that uh, in my quest to internationalize myself, because just because of the opportunities, I mean, with the internet and the ability to travel, it's not that expensive relative, or shouldn't be for most people, but I've encouraged people to expand their horizons. And one of the things I kind of missed out on, I've kind of started to move towards it, then not is real estate. 
And one of the things I've watched a lot of blogs, read a lot of, or watched a lot of videos, watch, listened to, read a lot of blogs is I think there's a lot of hesitancy. I'm not going to get into the individual person. I mean, that's up to each person that whether they have the gumption to pick up and, you know, go even visit other countries or move. But if someone's interested in international real estate investment, I mean, there's so many possible advantages with some residency things that can happen in some countries and other things. But I think there's a major stumbling block about like, you know, how, how does one do that? How does, what are some of the pitfalls? What would, I mean, having done this and, and started out and having all this experience, what are some things that you saw that you didn't realize or some things that um, were pitfalls or something that you would give advice and say, look, I mean, in a general sense, obviously, but if somebody was interested in doing that, how would they, what would be the best way to proceed? That's a very good question. Cause it's, it's actually, it's hard because um, there are two ways. One is to just go to a country for a week and just see a bunch of viewings, meet with a few real estate agents, and then throw a few offers, close a deal, move on. You can do this and you'll get, if you're lucky, you'll get a market related um, price, but generally you'll tend to overpay as a foreigner or buy something that has flaws that you're not aware of. So just to, to give an example, going back to, for, for your American audience, mistakes that Europeans would typically make when investing in the US so that people really understand that it can be the same abroad or, but with different quirks. You can, Europeans have different standards when it comes to housing. In the US, if you buy a house that's 30, 40 years old, it's generally an, an old house. Uh, for a European, it's actually pretty new. So Europeans don't understand that housing in America depreciates a lot faster than back in Europe. And there's even, you can even, there's even depreciation in your tax code for property, which typically there isn't in Europe. So that, that's how fundamental the difference is in, in understanding of, of property between different countries or just buying a, a house you can have two streets somewhere in America and one street is 30% more expensive than the other one. And they're just right across from each other. But one is in a bad school district. A European typically would not necessarily understand the implications of a bad school district and would go for that house that's 30% cheaper. And then the European won't understand why he, he, he or she can't rent out the, the house or just gets problematic tenants. Because in Europe, generally, it's not a problem. So when you go abroad and you buy property, the big risk is not just the known unknowns, but the unknown unknowns that you find out later. So that's, that's one. Um, two, the America, the American housing market is very data-driven. You have an MLS it's pretty much the only place in the world where you have such data, such a data rich environment in terms of real estate. In most countries in the world, you just have different agents who have their own listings and some listings will be at, f at a few different agents. And you need to go to all of these agents, you know, literally walk to 10 different real estate agencies and speak to the agents and give them briefs to actually get, to actually see the stock that's out there. Um, but if you just go to one, you'll be restricted to that agent's listings, which can be an issue if he doesn't have what you need in stock or has it, but there's a better deal out there, but just you didn't actually go there. And that's, that's a mistake that many Americans make when they go abroad. They'll talk to a real estate agent. They like the real estate agent, and then they just go for it, go with that person. But then they miss out on all the other listings. And also people need to be prepared for a bit more ambiguity. Um, so yeah, in the States, you tend to do the, how's it called? You know, when you buy the, when you buy a house and you have a guide, yeah, an inspection, yep. in many countries, <laughs> there are no inspections. <laughs> like you, you'll even go to people and you'll say, oh, I need someone to do an inspection. And like real estate agents will look at you and say, what do you mean an inspection? Oh, I need someone to check, you know, if the pipes are good, if the roof is fine. And they'll just look at you and they'll be able, well, I don't know, just, you know, here are the keys um go check out the house you know bring back the keys later this afternoon just 
figure it out. <laughs> yep. Then you end up kind of doing inspections yourself. Um, and if you hire someone to come check it out, the person won't really understand the brief. It's like what they want to pay me to just like look around. And the guy who's in charge of the roof will just do the roof and you won't like want to do the pipes. So technically you'd have to bring like seven different people. No one's going to want to come for this. So you need to be able to deal with this level of ambiguity. Um, so you're likelier when you buy abroad to buy a house that, or an apartment that has issues down the line. And it's not like America where, you know, you just go and sue and lawsuits here and there. Like no one will care. It's just, okay, you bought it. It's your problem. You know, you signed it. You had the opportunity to look at it too bad for you. So really understanding that everything is completely different. Um, also access to credit can be, can be hard. Generally banks do not want to lend money for real estate investments abroad because they want to have, they want to be able to seize the collateral. So unless you manage to find a deal with a lender in the States and you give something in the States as collateral, they generally won't be keen for you, for you to use money to go buy property somewhere else. Um, or you need to be a high net worth individual and, you know, have a few million dollars in investments offshore in Singapore or, or in Switzerland. In these cases, such banks can give you um, some access to, to lending and then they'll use your investments as collateral. And then also that's, that's tax complexity. Um, taxes change. It's not all, taxes are not always very straightforward in some countries. Um, and it's important to get proper tax and, and legal advice because you may or may not be able to get a credit, a tax credit for whatever taxes you've paid in the country you've bought property. So it's important to check with the tax professional, um, both in the country where you're buying and in your home country as well. And if you do that in the States, it's quite important to have a CPA that understands the international space. Because if you just go to your usual CPA, the CPA you've been using for 10 to 15 years, that CPA is probably not very aware of all the quirks in the, in the laws uh, when it comes to, to taxation and, and foreign, foreign property and the credits that are allowed. And God knows how complicated the IRS is. Yes, indeed. Um, one of the things I found useful when I was considering this, or even when I travel now, I I don't just go to a place for like a week, um, and I usually go someplace for like a month or so, and I'll rent an apartment, uh, usually in a city center or somewhere or in an area. Uh, and what I'll try to do is reach out and. Um, make relationships, just like you're saying, with multiple professionals, like lawyers are a good place to start. If you can try to find out who like one of the better law firms is or a trusted law firm in the city you're in or country, and you can form a relationship with them, that can open a lot of doors for a lot of other things, I think. That's what I've found in the past. And That's... I mean, I actually did it in a, one country where I found out who the law, one of the top law firms was. I placed like a $2,500 retainer with them. And also I'm starting getting invited to parties and stuff. I mean, people only know what you tell them. I don't mean to deceive people, but if you come in and act like you actually have some concept of what you're doing and not just some, you know, show up in flip flops and a, you know, I'm with stupid t-shirt or something. I mean, like you're a professional, you know what I mean? So you're, you're yeah. trying to do this seriously. And uh, I think uh, that's what kind of makes it more of an opportunity because there's a certain arbitrage because it's not, is necessarily easy as it is like in the states or maybe even in some countries in western europe but that that's one thing that i have found in the past what are some of the advantages like i mentioned earlier like i have studied on and i'm seeing more of this now probably not less maybe it's just because of the internet certain investment thresholds that can be reached in certain countries that can lead to residency or tax advantages or even up to citizenship if people are interested in those types of things you know, I've always advocated, I'm stealing this from Doug Casey from like three decades ago, but he's always said you should have your business in one country, your bank in another and live in a third. I mean, 
that's just kind of a general statement, but the concept makes sense. And I'm, and with the situation, the way things are going with the West, which we don't have time to get into, I mean, I'm really encouraging people to look around the rest of the world. So what are some of the advantages of some people, especially like high net worth people, there's high net worth people that listen to these videos. Um, what are some of the potential advantages for dual citizenship, residency, tax advantages? Maybe you could give us a little bit of uh, information on that. Sure. So before going into the advantages, I'd like to get back to that point you just mentioned, which I think is, is very important and that we need to emphasize for your audience. It's about taking your time. So if you can, you're completely right. Go to the country for a month, rent an apartment, preferably not just in one place, but spend one week in one neighborhood, another week in another neighborhood. So you get a feel for different neighborhoods. And yes, go speak to lawyers and just speak to anyone and everyone. If, if your American audience believes that Americans love real estate, then they should go abroad. And then you'll see that people are even more passionate about real estate because unlike in the US, generally other markets, especially developing markets are not as financialized. So people don't have as many investment opportunities. It's either you keep money in the bank, you open a business, or you buy real estate. And often people won't necessarily want to keep their money in the bank for obvious reasons, low interest rates, et cetera, or a history of bad banking, of, of banking issues. So they buy real estate. So there's a, a disproportionate amount of real estate experts when you go abroad. <laughs> so literally when you're there, have talk to everyone. If you go to a bar, just pay some beers to people, show them the map of the city and say, hey, you know, I'm considering buying in this neighborhood. What do you think? And everyone will have an opinion. People can be very opinionated when it comes to real estate. <laughs> and you speak to many people with very different opinions and you try to get a representative sample. And after just even like two, three weeks, you'll have a much better understanding of the market and even just showing listings to people, to locals, pay them a beer. It'll cost you like, if you go to Montenegro, for example, three bucks for, for, uh, for nice beer, for a good pint, uh, just pay someone a $3 beer and show that person, uh, show the guy the listing and say, Hey, you know, I'm looking at this. What do you think? And people like to be perceived as experts. People like to be listened to. Um, especially when it's a topic they're interested in and you'll get a lot of insight that way. Like, and trust me, the beers that you'll be paying your, your beer budget, you'll be getting like hundred X on it <laughs> in terms of avoided mistakes and learnings, et cetera. So so if you can like if you, crowdsource your uh, info a little bit and then you, you, you should be able to get a good, like you said, a good sense. Yes. Yes. That, that, that makes sense. That's, that's excellent advice. So to go back to your question in terms of advantages. So in some countries you can get better yields than in the US. Um, so I think that's attractive. In some other countries as well, you can find better, you can hope for better capital gains. But again, it's, you need to look specifically for markets because if you think that America is having a housing bubble, then you know watch Western Europe with uh, with interest rates that are even lower. Um, so the reality is there are housing bubbles all over the world. Now, does it mean that they're gonna crash? Not necessarily. They might go even higher with uh, money printing. Honestly, I don't know whenever people ask me, oh, do you think prices are gonna continue going up? Are they gonna crash? I don't know. Like the whole central bank um, experiences that are, gonna be, that are being played right now, I, I don't know how it's gonna end up playing in the what the results are going to be in the in the real estate market but you do find markets with healthy fundamentals and you do find markets with good yields uh, so that's one aspect in terms of there's also the lifestyle aspect um, so in some cases in some countries that don't have too many regulations you can do like Airbnb for 10 months of the year. And then two months of the year, you can keep the apartment for yourself. And, you know, generally you just kind of keep a, a wardrobe, you, you lock it, lock it up, and then you can keep your personal stuff in the wardrobe. So when you come back, 
you know, it'll just take you two hours to put everything back like it so that you feel at home. So that's, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting benefit. And then there's the whole plan B aspect, which you, which you discussed in some countries, owning property gives you residency rights. I think that's quite interesting. Um, Montenegro on the, so south of Croatia on the Adriatic Sea is an example. If you own property as an American, as a Canadian, as it doesn't matter which country you're from, you are entitled to having residency for you and your family. So if you're tired of America, tired of Canada, and you just want to, you know, move to Europe and be able to live there full time, um, which is typically hard to do in the European Union, because the laws are more, more stringent. In a few countries in the Balkans, just by owning property, which is often quite affordable, um, you can have your residency card, which means you can live there full time, you can bank there, you can uh, buy a car, and you know get local much cheaper health care so it opens you to a a world of opportunities really citizenship you in some cases there are some um, citizenship by investment countries uh, for example in the in the caribbean whereby you buy real estate and then it, you can get real estate uh, you can get citizenship sorry but typically that real estate is really overpriced. So I wouldn't say it's, it's an investment. You're really just buying citizenship. But there is right now Turkey. Um, you can buy $250,000 worth of real estate. And property right now in Istanbul is really affordable because the lira crashed. And that entitles you to citizenship immediately. Within three months, you get your passport. Um, and it's you're paying market related prices because you can just buy it in the open market, you know, like a Turk. Um, so that's actually quite appealing for a quarter million dollars. You can become Turkish. I'm not sure a lot of Americans want to become Turkish, uh, but um, it's, it's not a bad passport. It gives you access to the Middle East, to much of Asia, a lot of Africa, all of Latin America, Central America. It just doesn't give you access to like the other NATO countries generally. Um, so yeah. And finally, from an investment point of view, it gives you diversification. I think that's, that's very important, especially nowadays. There is so much crazy happening everywhere that it's hard to be hundred percent sure of one's own thesis <laughs> in life. And you want to be hedged. And one way to be hedged is to have real estate abroad in a different country. It's generally better asset protection as well. And it, offer, it can offer you income in a different currency. So it can be a currency, currency diversification. It can also be geopolitical diversification. And here we can talk about Nicaragua. I know Nicaragua has a bad, uh, bad reputation in the US for for the for the president there ortega he's more aligned to he's more aligned to the other side the russians etc the reality is you can buy property for half or a third of the prices in of costa rica it's if you structure it properly um it can entitle you to residency rights and when you're resident when you're a resident of Nicaragua, a tax resident of Nicaragua, if you choose to live there, you get taxed on a territorial basis. So you only get taxed on locally sourced income. So income outside of Nicaragua, in most cases, again, you need to, to speak to a lawyer and structure it well, um, you will not have to pay any taxes on that to the, Nicar to the Nicaraguan tax authorities. So of course, if you're American, you still need to deal with the IRS, et cetera. Um, but just that in itself, you know, you buy some undervalued property in Nicaragua, you can get some modest cash flow. So I'm not saying it's a, it's a good investment, you know, in terms, I don't see any catalyst for, uh, capital gains in the, in the near future, but it gives you a plan B option in a country that is not politically aligned 
to your own country. So it's geopolitical diversification. Interesting to note on Nicaragua, uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time in Central America a few years ago, and I actually found Nicaragua to be a lot safer and a little bit better than Gua Guatemala or Honduras for, for sure. There's actually Bill Bonner who runs Agora. They have a big resort down on the Pacific side in, in um, Nicaragua. I can't remember the name of it now, but I also met another guy at an investment conference that has a big, big uh, estate there. He built, uh, he's from Kansas. He's a, in the petroleum business. Um, and I actually have a portfolio company that uh, does, uh, has a geothermal plant there and the government pays every month on time and hard currency. They have never defaulted. They have never failed to live up to their obligation. So it's like one of these things again, where I think if you are, if you have home country bias, which unfortunately I don't mean to sound elitist or denigrate or call people provincial, but a lot of people in the U S it is a continent. So people don't have a tendency to, you can just be here your whole life and see a lot of things and enjoy a lot of things. Um, don't have the, they take all their news. And they, I think a lot of times they have a skewed view of some of these places that maybe isn't accurate. Once you go there and you say, well, this isn't really what I was told. I mean, mm -hmm. so um, that's one of the things I, I find interesting. So I, I was interested. That's curious that you even uh, named that place, but that, that's interesting. Um, one of the things I'd like to touch on, I'm not, you're not a tax attorney and I know you're not a, an, a political analyst or anything, but one of the things I have found, uh, and you're not, I don't, you're not a U.S. citizen, I believe, right? You're, you're. I'm not, no. Okay. Thank God. So, well, <laughs> so one of the things I found, I mean, one of the things that was interesting, I had fortunate that I met people many years ago that introduced me to a Swiss banking relationship. And it actually was canceled 10 years ago by the Swiss because they didn't, uh, the Swiss bankers I had it was a totally different banking situation that I, you will ever experience in the United States. I can guarantee you. Um, it was awesome. It opened up a lot of things, but because of the vice of things and some of the things, I just didn't want to, I mean, unless you had like, I asked my banker, I said, he says, well, if you have a hundred million, we can talk, but you don't have that. And we're just not going to deal with the, you know, it was a small Canton bank, but, uh, um, a lot of services. The thing, point I'm trying to make here is, are you seeing, I mean, you talk to Americans, you deal with Americans. I mean, it's getting sometimes increasingly harder because of the actions of the U S government itself that a lot of like, if you're in some of these places, um, you still will need like to get a bank account or have some banking relationship. And there's some things people can do like in Georgia and stuff I know, but it seems like, are you seeing or hearing anecdotally it's getting more difficult for Americans to do things uh, in the real estate sphere? Cause you still, or people not want to deal with them or is it like, I mean, I remember in Mongolia when I was there during the boom and Cuppy was there, they were closing deals with, you know, literally brown bags full of cash and then walking over to the title or the, government office and getting the stamps i mean or is it somewhere in between there i don't i don't know but are you seeing anything of that for americans where people are saying like we just don't want to deal with you guys or what's your experience with that from, from a real estate point of view generally it's not an issue um people will be happy to have americans buy real estate and in every country because if if you own real estate in a country generally you'll want to have a bank account locally as well just to pay utilities your local taxes uh, whatever et cetera internet and many banks will not want to deal with um, U.S. persons but there in each country there there's always at least one or two banks that are fine if you own real estate so from that point of view I'd say your options have become a bit more restricted but. It's, it's still fine. It won't prevent you from doing real estate deals anywhere. Um, but if you want to bank offshore, like yourself, um, with your own money, as a U.S. person, it's become a lot more complicated. Um, so, for example, banks in, uh, banks in Singapore, which are known for being uh, well capitalized and safer, and Singapore is, is perceived to be the, the new Switzerland. Um, so if you believe that the center of the world is shifting from you know, the North Atlantic to Eurasia, that part of the world, then elite banking is also making that shift. And that, that shift is, is going to, to Singapore, increasingly as well with um, funds going out of, uh, out of Hong Kong. So 
it's possible as a non-resident to open bank accounts um, with generally 250,000 US. And you can as a US citizen, but many of the banks will tell you, we're not gonna sell you any investments, not even a term deposit. So you can open an account with us, but it's just cash for basic transfers, like for your savings, and to buy, you know, real estate or to your brokerage, uh, but we won't sell you any investments. Um, so banking abroad as a U.S. person is increasingly hard from, from that point of view um, because of the extra compliance that's required on, on banks, uh, on the bank's end. And it's, it's very costly for them. So it's not that banks don't want Americans. It's the U.S. government has made banks not want Americans just to... to so that to contextualize the issue. No, that's exactly right. I mean, that's what my Swiss banker told me. He says, look, we just don't have the resources to do the compliance for the size of the accounts that we do have with Americans. He was very not, ha he was upset that, I mean, I knew the guy for 10 years, you get assigned a guy, you form a relationship and uh, he was upset and I was upset. I mean, I was on a, actually in Central America on a job and I got called on my Blackberry. This is back when we still had Blackberries. It's like, we got to terminate this, John. And it's unfortunate. And, and I was, I was able to take advantage of certain investments. You know, that, that was a relationship. You actually sit down. It's a different experience for people. If you can get in some of these uh, relationships um, where you're going over your goals, what you want to do, there's a reviews um, based on, you know, twice, three times, whatever you decide. And, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to formulate a plan and these folks are trying to help you accomplish your plan. So yeah, it was, uh, it's different than going in here where, you know, uh, you know, it's a joke here in the States, banking relationships, it's just give us your money and there's fees for everything. And you see a different person. I mean, transferring money, I've had to walk bankers at Wells Fargo through the process to do their own money transfers. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. ridiculous. So anyways, Enough on that. To, to be fair, rant. yeah, I, I know I, I also went on a bit of, of of a rant myself here. But to be fair, the the U.S. government is not not the only one doing this to no, people, that's, to that's its right. citizens. Yeah. Um, in the in the European Union, for example, people residing in the European Union do not have access to the vast majority of American ETFs. Yes, that's true. Um, so, as a European, if if, if I were to live in the European Union, which I don't, I would not have access to some of these very attractive American ETFs and I'd be restricted to stuff in Paris and, and Frankfurt. <laughs> the choice is a lot smaller. <laughs> exactly. So let's, uh, yeah, before we get to this, could descend it very rapidly <laughs> into a black hole. So we move on. Um, one of the things I found interesting, I want to go to your uh, talk about a recent article you wrote just as an example and just because i have interest in both two out of the three places you wrote this very excellent article on your blog and it was uh, i don't know the title something like uh the three top real estate destinations or investments for two, 2021 or something like that and two out of the th i was one was uh i believe kiev in the ukraine or in ukraine um tashkent in uzbekistan and then cairo in egypt now i'm quite familiar with the uh, situations in Ukraine and uh, Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is probably my top frontier market. I mean, this thing is like, I am so excited about Uzbekistan. Um, yeah, I have a tremendous amount of uh, investment there now, not in real estate, but uh, can you just give us a little brief? And then I want you to kind of like talk about the Cairo thing. Cause I have some questions like, how'd you even find out about that? How'd you get involved with it? What's going on there? This is an example of the typical person doesn't even have a clue they're completely rebuilding a new city there uh it's it, it was i found it i mean i did further on research i was just like shocked i didn't even know about it. there's videos there there's all kinds of drone footage i was like this is wild no one even knows what's going on so i don't know if you could just touch on that article and maybe briefly on each one of the those uh areas i thought that was very interesting Thank you, John. So yeah, so um, I wrote an article called the top three international real estate investment markets for 2021. So it's based on my own experience. So really, my, my model is that I go to countries for at least a few weeks, generally a few months even to do on the ground research. And so when I saw that 
Uzbekistan was opening up because um, I, I had worked in the past. I had um, I'd been a volunteer lecturer at the American University of Central Asia in Kyrgyzstan. So I speak Russian. And once I heard that Uzbekistan was opening up, that the dictator had died, the, I forgot his name, it's complicated. Let's call him new guy. New yeah. guy came to power and he's implementing all these reforms and rolling out the red carpet for, for foreign investors. I just booked a flight to Tashkent, got an Airbnb for a month and started doing what you do as well as, you know, meeting with lawyers, meeting with uh, real estate agents, et cetera. And my goal, because I, I have more of a focus generally on, on real estate, my goal was to, you know, just buy a, buy a small apartment right downtown and then hold it for the, hold it for the long term, and get some rental income. When I got there, I saw that buying as a foreigner is in some neighborhoods is allowed, uh, but it's a bit of a two tier system. So it's a neighborhood where foreigners are allowed, but the others are not. So it's a bit more expensive, more than it should be. And in the other neighborhoods you can buy, but you need to go through a local company. And it's a little bit of a legal gray zone. Uh, you'd want to speak to a lawyer before making a move, but it's possible. Um, but then I saw the, the, uh, the opportunities on the, on the local stock exchange. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I was looking at some of these numbers and it's like, you know, like dividend yields of like 15, 20%, almost no debt growth of 20, 30% a year. And you look at the fundamentals of the country, booming demographics, tons of natural resources, low government debt right in the center of the new Silk Road. So Chinese investment, uh, Russian investment, Indian investment, Korean investment, Turkish investment, European Union investment, American, like everyone's investing there. <laughs> so I, um, I went there to buy an apartment and I came back with a brokerage account. But the reality is that for people who are adventurous, um, I'd say if you don't speak Russian, just stay away from that one. Uh, but it's a market that is inevitably going to go up. I mean, uh, it's going to reach, it has to reach the levels of Almaty in Kazakhstan. There you have uh, per square meter. I know your audience is more familiar with uh, square feet, but like for international real estate, um, guys, you need to adapt yourself. <laughs> it's square speak. meter. It's square meters. <laughs> Um, it's about fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a square meter, and in Tashkent right now, you you have like real estate in the center for about a thousand dollars a square meter, and yields of eight, nine, even ten percent if you if you really manage to find a good deal. So that's a market that has all the right fundamentals. It's just you need to be adventurous and be willing to deal with uh, some legal gray zones. So you wouldn't want to overexpose yourself either. The second market is Ukraine. So whenever I mention Ukraine, people think, oh, war, catastrophe, et cetera. And not just in America, in, in Europe as well. And th that's actually the point. That's what makes it attractive. <laughs> Prices have gone down 75% from peak. Peak was I think in 2010 or 2011 and they've been consolidating for two, three years now. So big drop in prices and consolidation. So people say, oh, but Ukraine is risky. It has so many problems. It's like, yes, and it's all priced in. Everything that could go bad went bad. So there was war, there were, there were multiple bouts of inflation. There, was, there were multiple instances of currency devaluation there was once the once ukraine signed a essentially open border agreement with the european union a large chunk of its youth migrated to central and western europe to, to get better paying jobs and it got a large part of its territory crimea taken away now that's pretty bad i think we can all agree that's pretty bad i mean at some point teachers were earning $200 a month. 
when I was working in Africa, teachers were in Ghana, teachers were earning $300, $400 a month. So it, it had sunk lower than West African countries. And yet prices aren't, haven't gone any lower. So anyone that had a weak hand over those nine years has sold. So right now you end up with a market where all the weak hands are gone. Prices have apparently reached a bottom, or at least there's very limited downside bar a full on war with Russia. Um, so it's just, what are the catalysts and interest rates keep dropping just like everywhere else in the world, interest rates keeps dropping. So we're likely to see a mortgage boom. And that is a major catalyst. And if that catalyst were to be pushed back in time, Kiev has the highest um, real estate uh, yields in Europe. So it's like limited downside. Your carry cost is next to nothing, like property taxes are next to nothing. The yields are high and there are a few catalysts. So sure, there are some risks. Like when you buy there, you want to make sure you follow the proper process for capital controls to be able to get your money out later on because that's uh, that's that can be a little bit tricky and you want to make do proper due diligence on the actual condition of the building especially if you buy a historical building because the building may look nice but its uh, foundations might be rotten in many cases so you need to do proper due diligence um, but if you manage to, to, to pull it off, it's, it's a very interesting play. Um, there are also funds. Uh, there's a fund managed by a Canadian. He invests in a, a micro niche in the, in the market in Kiev. And he promises people yields of 15 to 18% gross a year. And then he can give you the whole breakdown. You know, this is how much we paid for it per square meter. This was the renovation per square meter. This is how much we're renting it out. Boom, boom, boom. All the details. So it's, it's, I find it to be a very interesting market. And last but not least, and this is, a, this is an oddball, I was not expecting to add uh, this one to the list. And it's the new administrative capital in Egypt. So it's not even Cairo, it's the new administrative capital. So I, I left Europe in, uh, in November because the army was in the streets and there were curfews and you needed to fill up pieces of paper to leave your home. And generally when things like this start happening, it's history has shown that it's, it's time to go. <laughs> so I left democratic Europe to go to a dictatorship in um, North Africa to experience freedom. And when I was there, I just discovered this massive project that the, I, I had heard of it a little bit, here, here, but like really nothing substantial. I didn't think much of it. The Egyptian government is building a brand new capital uh, 35 miles east of Cairo. Cairo's population right now is 20 million people and it is set to get to 38 million by 2050. It's like, insane. And if anyone's been in your audience has been to Cairo, it's a hellhole. It's horrible. It's polluted. It is crowded. Like the, the housing stock quality is atrocious. So there's people want, there's real demand for people to, for people to, to just live somewhere with proper roads and good infrastructure and cleaner air. Um, so the, the president has noticed that you know this Cairo situation is just not sustainable. So he's building essentially a new kind of Dubai um, east of east of Cairo. It'll have the tallest skyscraper in Africa, tallest expo, the biggest expo center in Africa. Uh, there's already a new international airport, and universities are already open. Huge mosques, uh, Coptic uh, Christian churches. So the project is actually happening and no one outside of the Middle East is aware of it. 
So people think Egypt only bad news and this and that. And honestly, I, that was my, like my expectations were very low when I went to Egypt and I was surprised. Like the, the government is actually implementing reforms, IMF type reforms, um, the ease of it's creeping up the ease of doing business rankings, though it's still a very tough place to do business, but it's, you know, the right moves are being made. Um, it's currency has stopped devaluating um, its foreign exchange reserves are up. So the government is making a lot of the right moves. So sure, they're always, there's still, you know, war in Libya next door and the country has a history of going through yo-yo faces. Um, politically, not everyone is 100% aligned with the, with the government. So there could be issues there. So, you know, Egypt has its issues for sure. But when you look at a country, it's, it's easy to say, invest in Singapore, you know, invest in Austin, you know, because like everything's great there. It's easy to invest in places where everything is fine, but that's not necessarily will, where you'll find the most upside. Sometimes you want to go to places where there are a lot of issues, but there's a number of catalysts down the road, which you see that could turn things around. And you want to make sure that all the issues are fully priced in, but not the catalysts. That's how you make money. So in Egypt, in the, the new administrative capital, so I went to see a few developers, you know, did a whole tour of the, like, essentially it's a desert right now with just construction everywhere. Um, and, you know, they were taking me through their projects, et cetera. I met with some lawyers. And at some point, one of the, one of the developers were driving and uh, he was like, yeah, like, you know, this developer went bust, uh, but the government gave the money back to the people, to the investors. I was like, what? <laughs> Why would the government give money back to the investors if, if the development went bust? It's like, oh yeah, because uh, if you invest in the new administrative capital, it comes with the government guarantee. It's like, what? <laughs> so essentially, if you buy in that territory and the developer goes bust, the government commits to either give you your money back without interest or complete the project. And so I was like, really? Like, do you have a paper? And then you know, called the secretary and after a while, some like PDF emerged and all in Arabic. It was like, oh yeah, it's written here. So I took this PDF um, to some lawyers and was like, is, is my understanding correct? And people are like, a bit blasé, like, yeah, yeah, that's what it means. <laughs> and you can buy real estate off plan for less than $500 a square meter. So in like, I think it would be like less than $50 a square foot for, you know, you'll get the real estate in like three years or so. Like it's, it's an interesting speculation, um, especially with the downside risk being covered by the government. Now, what's a, an Egyptian government guarantee worth? That's another debate. But there are some unique investment uh, propositions out there. And that's what I love about traveling around and going to all these markets and spending time on the ground is you just discover these, uh, these things, like these little gems. Yeah, I think it's interesting. That that's exactly the point that I want you to make. It's not like, oh, let's all get on, a, um, you know, Egypt air flight and go over to Cairo and buy, go to the, you know, buy apartments. I guess the point is, is that if you're curious, if you will dig through the bargain bins, I mean, it's out there. That's really my whole philosophy. I mean, I mean, people can do this. I tell people to just go on the internet, go on YouTube and just type in Tashkent Metro. It has one of the best metros. Uzbekistan, for example, the Soviets, took a lot of time to really industrialize and spend a lot of money in this in the country and um, diversified it's you know it's now it was kind of in a dictatorship it was kind of closed off but that's it's completely you know the shackles are being taken off and, and very rapidly and conditions are being put in place I use the example okay you see what happened with like the Asian tigers that was before uh, you know in the early 80s mid 80s you know 
Malaysia, you know, these places like that, Indonesia, when they first start, I mean, you see the compounded growth over time. That's what you talk about. And that just spills over into so many opportunities. And you look at a country like Georgia, that's at the top of the list. I mean, of ease of doing business, uh, corruption goes down. I mean, these places are not perfect. They're not the new Singapore's, but they are creating conditions. They know that they're competing or they get the view Maybe in some cases, hey, if I make the pie bigger, I can steal more. Whatever the motivation is, um, it creates opportunity. And you get, con like in Georgia, I mean, I think the economy has grown with the 5% plus for the last 10 years or so, with the exception of last year because of COVID. But that compounds and that creates a spillover effect into real estate, into the you know businesses, uh, the, the markets, uh, the stock market, if you will, all kinds of other opportunities. And that's kind of the example I use is like, what, what is the original thesis? I want to go to a place, I want to put my money where it's going to be welcomed, capital is welcome, reforms are happening. And then I look at other situations like where I'm at now, and it's totally opposite. You know, when I go to Russia, and I have a visa already, I go right through customs, it's not a problem. Nobody, it's not like a KGB agent takes me into a room and interrogates me and hits me in the head. Uh, with a phone book and ask me what I'm doing there. I come back to the U S and, you know, why were you in this country? What were you doing there? You know, why do you know, what do you care? I've presented a valid passport. I want to reenter my country. And you could just see, you know, capital is not the, 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 like you said, I mean, the tenor in the West is changing and it behooves people to at least explore these opportunities. That's all I think, you know, is the beginning of the stage, you know, plant the seed in people's head, it uh, doesn't mean just pick up and go to these places and, you know, with a bag of cash, but plant the seed, there's, make the world your oyster. And uh, there is a lot of opportunity out there. And there's, uh, things are changing. People are realizing there's a lot of people, especially in a country like Uzbekistan. I saw the same thing in Mongolia. These are the places you have younger people that have been educated outside the country, a diaspora, uh, they've done well you know, they want to come back and, you know, they don't want to do things the old way. And you start seeing reformists, you know, get in, it, it creates opportunity. And I think to your point, because it's, there's a dearth of information, it's not easy. There's not just an ETF I can buy on, on my phone that I actually have to do some work. That is really what creates a lot of the opportunity in my mind. Amen. So we're kind of getting to the end here. I think this is a pretty good interview. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to uh, kind of show you, let you talk about, you know, your website or blog or whatever you're we're calling it, but it's really great. Um, wandering investor. Um, maybe you want to talk about this a little bit. And I think you actually offer some services on here. I'm not going to, you know, I, I haven't availed myself of anything, but I think it's very interesting. Just some of your interviews and your articles and then some of the things you do. Maybe you could talk about this a little bit. Yeah, so it's just, you know, my blog, I travel around the world. Um, and I just look at all these different investment opportunities, residency options, banking options. Um, and then I just I write and, you know, interview some people along the way. And people can can follow my my journey. And hopefully they can spot a, a few opportunities that are appropriate for their own situations. Okay, great. And it's important for people to sign up to the private list. So I'm on YouTube as well, The Wandering Investor. But most of my content is on the website. It's in, in writing. So sign up to the private list. And now with the whole deplatforming thing, really <laughs> sign up to the private list. Yeah. Um, I think it's been interesting. I think you've really kind of, I don't know if it's just been recently, if you just decided to do this, but it seems like you're putting out a little bit more YouTube content and some of the interviews you've done recently have been pretty interesting. Like the last one with, um, I forget how to pronounce his last name, but the guy that runs the Africa Alliance Fund. I mean, I've been, following, yeah, I've been following his story. That is another example right there. So, um, so you've had some interesting people. Is that going to be something you do more of, do more, you're going to be doing some more in, uh, interviews with some interesting type people? Yeah, 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 I will. I'll be doing, um, yeah, a bit more writing, a bit more YouTube. It's this this blog is is um, gradually shifting from blog for fun to you know part time business. So I'm I'm allocating more of my time to it now, for sure. All right, awesome. All right, Ladislaus, thanks a lot. We appreciate it, and uh, 
like I said, visit uh, the site, Wandering Investor. I signed up. I'm, I get uh, the emails. They're, they're great. And uh, the content's great. So uh, definitely appreciate your time today. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you.